Okay. Uh, so uh, we do have some new stuff uh, the last couple, couple of classes, and we're continuing to talk about alternative routes to justice, right? So um, the whole first half of the course, uh, I've probably said this so many times, you're sick of hearing it, but the whole first half of the course was our uh, conventional civil action, which is this long winding road from claim to adjudication. And the whole second half of the course is alternative routes to justice, which are necessitated by shortcomings in that conventional civil action. Uh, okay, so uh, so we have our, our limitations, right? We, we know this this you know is not for everybody, and uh, it would be a very deficient civil justice system indeed if this were the only way to get justice for your clients. And one of the limitations of the conventional civil action is that it really only works best for uh, cases which are contained, entirely contained within our province or some other province, right? Um, the Ontario Rules of Civil Procedure are a provincial regulation based on the Courts of Justice Act. The powers granted by them are exercised by Ontario courts. And there's a lot of assumptions built into civil procedure that we're talking about a dispute which is contained within a jurisdiction. And most of the cases we've looked at, including Lapita and McCarthy Tetro, uh, are of that nature. So we need another alternative route to justice when that assumption no longer holds, right? When there's something in this, in the case or in law uh, or in the jurisdictional questions, which forces us to look outside the boundaries of Ontario. And that something is private international law, which is our subject for today. Okay, so just as a, um, uh, as a, as a place to start, uh, we should distinguish two different kinds of international law. So you may have heard of public international law. That's kind of public international law and private international law. Public international law is about relationships between states and international entities. So uh, if uh, someone discovers uh, a huge oil deposit right underneath the Ambassador Bridge in the Detroit River, um, and the Canadian government and the American government both claim uh, rights to it, then we would have to look to public international law to adjudicate that, right? Or disputes involving uh, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, all that is public international law. So um, that's everything we'll say about that. I'm interested in that. There's other courses, but, uh, but for our purposes, we're interested in private international law, which is defined nicely at paragraph 15 of the Van Breda case that you read for today. It's in essence domestic law, right? So that's important. This is not law that comes from the United Nations or uh, from some other international body. It's law which is made and applied right here in Canada. And it's designed to uh, answer a few different questions. Resolve conflicts between different jurisdictions, the legal systems or rules of different jurisdictions, and the decisions of courts of jur different jurisdictions. Um, beautiful sentence there, not. Uh, but here's a few examples that kind of clarify what they're talking about. So uh, legal principles that apply in situations in which more than one court might claim jurisdiction. So when there's something about a dispute which ties it to the courts of one province, but also ties it to the courts of another province or country. Secondly, situations to which the law of more than one jurisdiction might apply. And finally, situations in which a court must determine whether it will recognize and enforce a foreign judgment. So we're going to talk about all of these, but mostly number one today. Um, through uh, Rule 17 and then uh, Van Breda. And then we're also going to look at this Duez versus Facebook case, um, which uh, is about forum selection cl clauses, or another way to get at that um, same issue number one, right? Uh, a situation in which more than one court might claim jurisdiction. Okay, so Rule 17. Um, oh, sorry. 
didn't get to the end of the slide. It, it, a court must determine whether it will recognize and enforce a foreign judgment or in Canada, a judgment from another province, right? So the word international uh, is a little bit misleading because this is about international disputes, but also about um, questions arising as between, say, the courts of Manitoba and the courts of Ontario. Okay, so rule, uh, rule 17 uh, is where your readings began. And uh, this is uh, a, a rule of civil procedure, which is about, um, it's about the claim jurisdiction question, right? About how um, a court may claim jurisdiction. The first of those three things that Van Breda told us makes up uh, private international law. So it doesn't, this is what Rule 17 is about, but it doesn't tackle the question directly, right? Rule 17 does not say, you know, an Ontario court can claim jurisdiction if X or Y or Z is true. Instead, Rule 17 approaches this question by defining the circumstances in which you can serve someone who, uh, who is outside of the province. Uh, can anyone remind us what service is in general? What is service? Kind of a deceptively important idea we keep on coming back to. Put in play, serving the other party. Uh, uh, okay, so um, so people have got uh, some great examples of service here, right? Uh, making someone aware of the process uh, to bring parties into proceedings. So it does do that, but it does more than that. So originating process is a document which brings a party into civil litigation for the first time. And we have special uh, demands for service for that. Um, and informing the other party they're being sued. So, so that those are all examples of service. The, the official definition we introduced is a little bit broader um, than uh, just dealing with a statement of claim, uh, because it's not just statement of claim and it's not just originating process that has to be served. Can anyone give us a slightly broader definition? It's not just about bringing parties into a proceeding for the first time. Right? Delivery of documents, right? Service is all the rules, the special rules about delivery of documents for civil litigation. So, I mean, I can, I can see why people are focused on the statement of claim question, because if we go back uh, up to our material on service, um, you'll see that we have this originating process, right? So that's 16.01, and we talked about those special personal service um, uh, episodes where you have to actually hand a document to someone if it's originating process, but service is also about all the rest uh, of the documents as well, where the requirements are less onerous, but they are still there, right? It's uh, It would be um, very dangerous to assume that any document can just be delivered the way you would deliver uh, you know, a, a Christmas postcard to your best friend, right? You, you always got to think about service and think about uh, what um, method of delivery is required for the particular type of document you're, you're dealing with. Okay, so, so that's service in general. Uh, going back to Rule 17, it, it addresses itself to service outside of Ontario, right? So, um, and service of originating process, like a statement of claim uh, or notice of application. Um, and it, it does this as kind of a roundabout way to limit the number of the claims that Ontario courts will deal with, right? Because if you restrict the things about which you can serve a statement of claim on someone outside of Ontario, then you are, by doing so, restricting the types of civil disputes that Ontario courts are going to be required to deal with. Because we don't want people suing in Ontario courts over stuff that has nothing to do with Ontario, right? I mean, just because you live here and you pay taxes here doesn't mean that, you know, you can run off to uh, Zimbabwe and get involved in some dispute with someone there and then bring a lawsuit against them in Ontario courts. There has to be some limiting principle uh, which, uh, which restricts the authority of Ontario courts. Okay, so so you've got to, if you're suing someone outside of Ontario, you, you've got to fit your dispute into one of these categories, right? Rule 17 is a list of things that can uh, that can connect 
your dispute to Ontario with, with sufficient proximity that you're allowed to serve that person outside of Ontario. Um, okay, so if, uh, for example, a bunch of punks come over the bridge from uh, UDM, School of Law, and they, uh, they spray paint our law school, uh, and uh, then they mysteriously flee back over the bridge before they can be apprehended by, uh, by you know, local law enforcement. Uh, and we want to bring a civil suit against them to pay for, for fixing our beautiful brick wall. Uh, then um, Dean Waters will have no difficulty going back over the bridge and serving an Ontario Statement of Claim on UDM law for doing this because of these connecting factors so uh, so he can he can rely on this one right this this is this tort uh, is this defacement of our building is in respect of real or personal property um, in Ontario if um, uh, Dean Waters wants to uh, get an injunction right an injunction you recall is a well who remembers what an injunction is you can type that get that into comments for us yeah, cease an action, um, or in, in rarer cases, compel someone to do something. So, uh, so that's right. And um, and here, if that was the remedy he was seeking uh, to, you know, stop messing with our building, you uh, awful people, then uh, this provision here, Rule seventeen point oh two sub i, is going to let him serve that over there as well. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of them here. So I, I gave you um, a participation question um, about this, right? So I don't know if this question was maybe a little bit too uh, complicated without having the benefit of the lecture, but um, uh, so this is um, now a fairly old story, but one which gives rise to some, uh, some international, private international law issues. Right, because um, uh, you are representing this guy, uh, uh, Jamel Binion, and he wants to sh sue Shaq and Waka in Ontario, but they're not here. So uh, the idea with this exercise, and if you haven't had a chance to do it, maybe um, maybe take a few minutes uh, after class, uh, is to find the connecting factors um, that would let you uh, would, would let you do so. Right, so I think people got the big one. So, uh, so uh, seventeen point oh two sub G, uh, that's uh, that's an important one, right? So you can sue someone abroad if it's um, in respect of a tort committed in Ontario. Um, uh, so that um, um, apparently is the case on these facts. Um, and then uh, there's a few others which you might be able to run with um, that uh, that people have, have identified here. There's also kind of a catch-all one here that uh, that we should think about, right? Uh, 17.03. There's this kind of residual power of a court to grant leave to serve an originating process or notice of a reference outside Ontario. So, um, so I mean, the mechanics of this of this um, procedure. If uh, if someone, if you you're the one being served, right? Let, let, let's say you're outside or your client is outside of Ontario. Uh, and someone attempts to serve them with an Ontario statement of claim outside of the province, you as that defendant, I mean, you don't even want to call yourself a defendant because if you're taking the position that you cannot properly be a defendant, uh, you can bring a motion in an Ontario court under Rule 17 to have that uh, statement of claim struck out on the grounds that, uh, that none of these connecting factors are there. So, so this is uh, this is important, but it's it's not the end of the story when it comes to private international law, right? Because, you know, uh, if you sued someone about something which really has nothing to do with Ontario, uh, and you, you that person just happened to be passing through Ontario, right? Maybe they're you know catching a plane uh, at Pearson Airport to go from Zimbabwe to uh, to Chicago, and they're just passing through, and you know you happen to catch them here and serve them here then it would be illogical to say that, you know, just because of that, the Ontario court has to hear that, has to take, uh, take responsibility for that, right? Because uh, if there's nothing else which connects it to, uh, to, to Ontario. 
So, uh, so, so that's why we get into Van Breda and the question of forum nonconvenience, because we have to have other mechanisms to, uh, to ensure that, uh, that our courts are not unduly burdened with um, stuff that other courts should really be hearing. Okay, so Van, Be Van Breda is the next piece in your readings. And before we get to the facts, I wanted to uh, pick up on this question of uh, the constitutional underpinnings. So the Supreme Court in Van Breda refers at paragraph 20 to the constitutional underpinnings of private international law in Canada. What, what does this have to do with the Constitution? Um, I mean, why aren't we just talking about rules and cases uh, like we have been in most, in most weeks? What, are, what does the Constitution have to do with private international law in Canada? Um, uh, federalism and the Section 92 powers of provinces, right? So this is not about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is about um, Section, uh, about the, the 1867, the original Constitution Act, right? Uh, which establishes that, um, yes, as Natalie said, the Constitution confers certain powers based on jurisdiction, provincial versus federal. And, uh, and, and the powers of the province, the powers of, of a province uh, pertain only to um, matters that occur within the province. I thought I had this open, let me, uh, oh no, I've got it over here, right? Here we go. So section 92 um, establishes what provinces can do. The provinces derive their legal powers from the Constitution Act of 1867. Uh, and it says that um, in each province, the legislatures can make laws about property and civil rights in the province, the administration of justice in the province, right? So you're, you're probably used to, you know, all the little federalism cases, thinking about this in terms of, well, this is the sphere of provincial powers and this is the sphere of federal powers. But here, it's just about the fact that no province, um, you know, even if there were no federal government, the power of the province cannot extend to things which are unconnected to the province. So, uh, so it would be outside the power, ultra virus, outside the power of a, of a provincial government to purport to claim jurisdiction for its courts over things which have no connection to the province. Okay, so, th so there's a constitutional piece here. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, we're exclusively talking about um, the, 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 the whole question of jurisdiction is going to be determined by the courts applying the Constitution, right? Um, there is, nevertheless, uh, a power for legislatures and courts to adopt various solutions to meet the constitutional requirements and objectives of efficiency and of fairness that underlie our private international law system. It's just that. Uh, we should not think of this as an area where provinces can can make their own decisions w with uh, whatever uh, on whatever basis they want about private international law, because ultimately the constitution kind of ring fences their ability to uh, to extend the jurisdiction of Ontario courts. And the test that the 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 principle that you should uh, try to remember is this idea of real and substantial connection. That's the overall test um, when we're thinking about this from a constitutional point of view, um, that a province cannot have its courts take jurisdiction over civil disputes unless there is a real and substantial connection between the dispute and the province seeking that jurisdiction. Okay, so let's get into uh, Van Breda to unpack that idea. So um, the facts are, uh, are quite tragic. Um, it was uh, in June of 2003, uh, Morgan Van Breda, who's on the left there, and uh, her boyfriend, uh, Victor Berg, who's also a Canadian squash star, uh, went down to this all-inclusive resort in Cuba. They had a swim in the ocean, took a walk on the beach, uh, saw a metal athletic apparatus, like kind of a pull-up chin-up bar, uh, Mr. Berg went over to that, uh, wanted to show uh, what he could do, and, um, and so did Morgan Van Breda, and it was not properly constructed, not secured to the ground, so it collapsed, 
and uh, Morgan Van Breda fell to the beach and it fell on top of her, crushing her spine and leaving her paraplegic. So the other plaintiff in this case um, is Dr. Claude Charon, uh, who's not pictured here, but he had even worse luck on his Cuban all-inclusive vacation. He went scuba diving, the machine uh, scuba equipment malfunctioned, and he drowned. So let me ask you this as a kind of a preliminary piece. Uh, if Dr. Charon is dead, how can he be a party to this lawsuit? Okay, so his estate, uh, his estate can sue. I'm glad everyone seems to know that. It's great. Um, your your estate takes on the legal rights you had when you died, including your right to bring suits. There's also um, this is not a class action, um, no. Uh, uh, and you can't uh, uh, litigation guardianship is a, is a good idea, but um, you can't uh, be a litigation guardian for a dead person. Uh, it would be the estate trustee would be the person who brings it on behalf of the estate. Um, but there's also something else going on here. It's not just him. Um, did anyone catch it? Uh, when they refer to um, the Family Law Act claim. People may be familiar with the Family Law Act if you've taken family law, right? That tells us all about child support and uh, uh, custody and access of children and uh, division of matrimonial property. But what, why is the Family Law Act mentioned here? anyone know this? Because there's no reason why you would, because it's civil procedure and I haven't told you anything about it. Uh, but the Family Law Act, in addition to dealing with disputes arising from um, relationship breakdown, also entitles, um, no, it's not spells of sport, but entitles uh, family members to sue for, uh, for their losses resulting from an injury to a member of their family. So if, if your spouse uh, is injured in a way such that they lose their income, and uh, then you have a Family Law Act claim if you uh, were dependent on that income, um, have a job of your own. And uh, parents can also sue under the Family Law Act for injuries to their children uh, if that deprives them of the companionship of their children. Yeah, it's kind of like survivor benefits. Um, I mean, su survivor benefits are technically under the it's under the um, Canada Pension Plan, but this is like kind of a civil litigation version of that based on the idea that if you have suffered a loss um, as a result of someone in your family suffering an injury, then the Family Law Act entitles you to, uh, to bring a claim on that basis. Okay, so, so these cases were, it's not a class action, but, but Dr. Charon's case and Morgan Van Breda's case were, uh, were, were parceled together for the purposes of the appeal because they, they raised the same issues. There are several defendants named. Um, uh, perhaps uh, the most important one is Club Resorts Limited, uh, which is a company incorporated in the Cayman Islands that managed the two hotels where the accidents occurred, these two resorts in Cuba. So, uh, so they sue um, club resorts and these other uh, resort operator defendants. What is the what's the problem with these lawsuits, according to club resorts? What's the what's the private international law problem that the defendants raise with these lawsuits that Van Breda and Sharon and his family have brought in Ontario courts? Bingo, nothing to do with Ontario, right? Uh, they say uh, this should be dealt with in Cuba. And, you know, at first blush, you can sort of see where they're coming from, right? Um, not only is the defendant, the, you know, located outside of Canada, the resort itself is in Cuba, uh, the evidence will all be in Cuba, right? The, the, the equipment that, that fell on Morgan Van Breda, the scuba tank, um, all the witnesses who saw what was going on, you know, the guy who is supposed to maintain the, uh, the apparatus uh, will be in Cuba. Uh, and uh, so they say this has no business being in Ontario courts. All right. And obviously the plaintiffs feel otherwise. They want to sue in Ontario. But let me ask you this from kind of a you know, strategic point of view. Why do the parties care so much 
where this is heard, right? Because they went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees, without touching the substantive question of, you know, why did these people suffer these injuries? Why is it worth so much, the procedural question? The law in Cuba, uh, okay, so that could be the case, uh, as Musa says. Um, there's, there's no evidence of that in this case. Sometimes uh, you will feel that, or a plaintiff will believe that a foreign jurisdiction will have, you know, a substantive laws or a legal system which is rigged against the plaintiffs. Um, I'm not sure where Cuba stands on that right now. I mean, 20 years ago, we could have said probably pretty certainly that Cuba had a uh, at least a communist inspired system that would not be overly friendly to corporate defendants. That may no longer be the case. Um, okay, but a couple other good ideas here. So some jurisdictions are more plaintiff friendly, yeah, and they can be more plaintiff friendly either because of the substantive law or because you know, the, the system, there may be uh, corruption issues with the judiciary so elsewhere. Uh, bigger payouts in Ontario, that could, yeah, just, you know, the, our, our law or the way our juries think or so on. Um, does that. And then Jeremy also has a great point here, right? The cost of litigating in a foreign jurisdiction. We've already seen like how expensive litigation is, right? And, you know, discoveries, for example, this business of having your lawyer sit in a room at four or 500 bucks an hour for eight hours a day for two weeks. Okay, now imagine that you've got to find a lawyer who's willing to fly to Cuba and do that. And you, you can bet that you're going to be paying for their ticket, which will be a first class ticket, and you're going to be paying for their hotel room. And they're probably going to demand a premium because they don't want to go to Cuba um, to uh, to sit in this discovery room. So uh, so, so the, the costs and the convenience um, involved in, in being in a different jurisdiction. So, so this forum selection business, right? Where we're gonna, remember we talked about class actions last time. We said that, you know, class actions are tightly, hotly contested at the certification stage, right? The certification stage is just about whether this is gonna proceed as a class action or whether it's gonna have to proceed as a normal conventional civil action. And the defendants um, basically spend the big bucks fighting certification. And then if certification is granted, then usually it settles um, pretty quickly thereafter. These are kind of the same, right? Uh, the, the strategic advantage of the defendants of getting this out of Ontario courts um, and the strategic advantage to plaintiffs of keeping it in Ontario courts are so great that, uh, that the settlement is probably going to follow pretty quickly and the dollar amount on that settlement check is going to be greatly determined by, uh, by where it has to be heard. Because Van Breda and, and Sherman's lawyers are never realistically going to launch a, a lawsuit in uh, a Cuban court. Like, they, I mean, they wouldn't they wouldn't know a Cuban court if it uh, landed on their lawn, right? They uh, and and the plaintiffs aren't going to get organized to do that either. Okay, so so if the defendants win, they'll be able to settle this for for a very small amount relative to what they'll have to pay if they lose. Okay. So, so the overall question um, is, uh, is where should this be heard from the system's point of view now, right? Should we let this dispute, which has a questionable connection to Ontario, nonetheless be heard in Ontario courts? So the first challenge for the plaintiffs uh, comes from Rule 17, right? They have to serve this statement of claim outside Ontario just to bring these people into, into the uh, lawsuit because it's a corporate defendant, but, but usually you have to serve it on, um, on, on a head office or at least a sufficiently high uh, executive um, outpost of that corporation, and that's probably not going to be Ontario. So there's a few uh, a Section 17 ones they could um, they could hang their hat on. They can say uh, that um, at least in Sharon's case, there was a contract made in Ontario. Um, the tort uh, is sort of committed in Ontario in the sense that the, the damages for Morgan Van Breda, you know, her um, her evolving uh, paraplegia and and sort of the sequelae of the injury happened in Ontario. So that's kind of like a tort um, happening in Ontario. So they, they got through Section 17, but Section 17 um, just lets you serve this defendant outside of Ontario. It is not the end of the story because the court can still say that it lacks jurisdiction. Okay, so the, 
the, the legal test that comes out of Van Breda tells us how to know whether a court should assume jurisdiction um, and uh, based on this real and substantial connection test. Okay, so, um, so this is the key passage here, paragraphs 99 to 100. The court has to establish whether a real and substantial connection exists between the forum, the subject matter of the litigation, and the defendant. If such a connection exists in respect of a factual and legal situation, then the court must assume jurisdiction over all aspects of the case. The party arguing that the court should assume jurisdiction has the burden of identifying a presumptive connecting factor that links the subject matter of the litigation to the forum. And then um, uh, if they fail to do so, then uh, the court, um, if the court concludes that it lacks jurisdiction because none of the presumptive connecting factors exist or because the presumption of jurisdiction that flows from one of those factors has been rebutted, it must dismay, dismiss or stay the action. Okay, so there's a few different things going on there. It's one of these tests that were like the, you know, the burden, the onus switches back and forth. So like the plaintiff is kind of on the spot to show something. And then if they do succeed in showing something, then the defendant gets their chance to show something else to, to, to still have a chance to win. Okay, so, uh, so let's talk about these presumptive connecting factors first, right? So, so this would be uh, Morgan Van Breda and Dr. Sharon's family. Uh, it, it, first, the ball is in their court to find something that connects their dispute to Ontario. So uh, they mention, um, they identify several potential presumptive connecting factors. Uh, if the defendant is carrying on actual, not just virtual business here. So seven years ago, carrying on business Ontario was a very simple question, right? Either, you know, the company was here selling stuff and running stores or they weren't. 2019, this is no longer so simple, right? Is a, is a you know, a multinational corporation which advertises and sells things over the internet and ships them through the post. Uh, are they carrying on actual business in Ontario? Um, so, so, so this can get a little bit fraught, but, uh, but, but the takeaway here is there has to be some kind of actual thing happening in Ontario, some sort of bricks and mortar um, or like a living human being working for that company in Ontario. So just Ontarians seeing the ads for a global company is not in of itself a presumptive connecting factor. Uh, was the contract formed here? Um, again, you know, an easy question to answer in, uh, in 1819, right? When people would have to be together, uh, uh, you know, in, in a room together or at least opening a letter to, to form a contract. Um, so, so now you, in contract law, you may have um, dug into the question of the location in which a contract is formed. Um, but if there's not, no part of that which is formed here, then that won't count as a presumptive factor. Does the tort occur here? Uh, and here it's usually about the actual tort, but sometimes it's about where the damages manifest as well. Is the defendant resident here? That's a pretty easy one, right? Uh, you know, um, someone who lives in Ontario uh, for sure, um, that would um, that that would count as presumptive connecting factor. Uh, why couldn't you sue both in Ontario and Cuba? Like, uh, okay, so so that's a great question. Um, um, Andrew's referring back to the Semantic and Ross case that we looked at uh, when we were talking about discontinuance and withdrawal. Um, so there, uh, the plaintiff sued in uh, both Saint Kitts, another Caribbean island, and in Ontario, and then they wanted to discontinue and withdraw their Ontario action. Uh, so you you can do that. Um, for, for the plaintiff here, uh, for Van Braden and, and Sharon, there's not necessarily that much to gain uh, because they really want the Ontario action to succeed, right? As, as we said earlier, um, the, the Cuban action would be so in, so uh, so risky and so inconvenient for the plaintiffs to advance. They're not expecting to get much out of that. So um, they, they know that if they lose Van Breda, they, they still have the option to bring the action in Cuba. Um, and in certain cases, a plaintiff would find strategic value in bringing those actions in, in, in different jurisdictions concurrently. Um, but, but often, you know, Ontario or the Canadian jurisdiction is, is the real prize. 
Okay, so some more presumptive connecting factors. Um, the defendant had to head office here. That's kind of a slam dunk. You, you're, it's almost uh, certain then you're going to be able to proceed here against them. Um, was the damage sustained here? We talked about that with the tort one as well. Okay, so so it's important to um, identify. These are not, this is not a weighing process, right? Um, you only have to find one of these, establish that one of these things exists as the plaintiff in order to, uh, to acquire this rebuttable presumption of jurisdiction. So typically a plaintiff, um, and, and this is something you'd have to establish in your pleadings, uh, because, um, or, or at least you, you want to mention in your pleadings, right? If there's a question about jurisdiction, then you want to uh, plead the facts that identify that presumptive connecting factor, bringing your defendant under Ontario's jurisdiction. Uh, and then, you know, if the defendant challenges your jurisdiction with a motion, uh, then you're going to have to have, have more facts, but it's, the onus is on you, but you just have to establish one. Um, so uh, if none of these exist, then the court will not take jurisdiction. You have to sue, uh, sue elsewhere. So uh, what, what, uni what unites these things? So the court talks about these presumptive factors, but they also identify the, um, the, the underlying principles or considerations, right? Which are fairness, predictability and comity. So here they're trying to show us what, uh, I mean, why are these things presumptive connecting factors? And, you know, why do we even need to have a presumptive connecting factor when we want to take, take jurisdiction? So, you know, fairness is kind of obvious. We're always trying to be fair. Um, the predictability uh, kind of pushes the other way, right? Because we don't want we don't want people to have to litigate over what court should take jurisdiction, right? We're always trying to encourage settlement. We're always trying to create a civil justice system which casts a shadow. You know this idea that the shadow of the law that we've talked about, that we, we want a system which lets people predict with reasonable certainty what a court would do and lets them make that prediction without having to engage in litigation. So when it comes to jurisdiction, in these cases like Van Breda and Sharon, where it's kind of on the edge, whether this actually belongs in Ontario, uh, the principle of fairness kind of pushes us towards letting judges make kind of discretionary decisions and decide on each individual set of facts whether to take jurisdiction or not. But that cuts against predictability and, and, and our desire to have clear rules that let people know their rights and let them know what a court would do without having to go through litigation to find out. And you can imagine very, very straightforward, highly predictable, bright line rules for this jurisdiction question, right? Such as we could say Ontario courts must always decline jurisdiction if the tort occurred elsewhere, right? So Van Breda and Sharon would be out of luck, but, uh, but we'd have a very predictable rule, but that would seem to cut against fairness. Um, so, so this tension between fairness and predictability runs through, uh, runs through civil procedure generally. Okay, so that leaves us with this third principle, uh, comity which they talk about at paragraph 74. So what, what is this about? I mean, is this, is this supposed to be funny? Because I'm not laughing. I don't know if, uh, can anyone unpack this, this comedy business? We just look it up in your dictionary or uh, if you got, um, Apple Spotlight, you can just like type in comedy association of nations. Yeah, I think Catherine's been using Spotlight. Uh, that's what I did earlier today. Um, association of nations for their mutual benefit. Okay. Maybe let's scroll a little bit down further in that definition. Uh, I mean, what, what is it? What, why is this relevant to the whole question of private international law and whether or not these poor people get to sue in their Ontario court or not? 
because comedy comedy is going to typically cut against plaintiffs. Yes, Andrew's got it. We having one. We want each jurisdiction to respect the laws of other jurisdictions. So, paragraph seventy-four. An attitude of respect for and deference to other states and, in the Canadian context, respect for and deference to other provinces and their courts. Okay, so what, what does this have to do with our question here? I mean, we're not talking about anyone, we're not talking about, you know, writing some insane message about, uh, you know, some other court into the rules of civil procedure. Uh, yes, this often works against plaintiffs, and for, for, for reasons we'll see in a second. But why? I mean, why is why is this principle of respect for other provinces and other countries relevant? Why would a court want to think about this when it's trying to decide what to do with Van Breda and Chiron? If we if we say uh, to Cuba, you know, um, look, we're gonna leave it to us, right? Never mind your so-called legal system. We're going to uh, handle anything that involves the slightest fraction of a connection to any Ontarian. We'll just take care of it here, right? How does that make Cuba feel, right? Lousy, because that's basically saying we don't trust your legal system and we don't think uh, that our people can get any type of justice in your courts. Um, and yeah, so so it's an element of reciprocity here, right? If we don't um, abide by comedy and show some respect and deference to other courts, which have in, in other jurisdictions, which have a more natural connection to these disputes, then we can't be surprised and we can't angry when they turn around and say, uh, you know, we're not going, we're going to take jurisdiction over anything um, with the slightest connection to Cuba, even if Ontario is a more natural. Uh, jurisdiction. Sure, all Cuban Canadians, uh, and there's, a, there's an element of, uh, of you know multiculturalism and respect for uh, for different groups of people here as well. If we did not respect building on the reciprocity idea, if we did not respect comity, then people uh, would be suing our companies, right? Canadian companies doing business abroad would be uh, would be brought into court in every far-flung corner of the world to uh and that would be extremely expensive um when when the natural subject matter of the disputes uh should be in ontario okay so let's let's try to think a bit more precisely about how uh these principles and factors work so so, so the, the connecting factors are what you actually want to look for in, in the facts, typically, right? The principles are kind of the bigger ideas which are at play and which have given us these presumptive connecting factors. So on, on any given fact pattern, we're not expecting plaintiffs to, you know, uh, in their statements of claim, um, get into comedy and fairness versus predictability. We just want them to look for presumptive connecting factors. However, these principles are also um, important, can be important if there is no presumptive connecting factor to be found because we can also have new connecting factors. Uh, so, uh, so if you can't, if the court cannot find a presumptive connecting factor, then it's left the door open to identifying new connecting factors. And the process of identifying new connecting factors will be based on these principles. So it's kind of interesting. Like they've, the, the Supreme Court of Canada here wants to give us a test, which is all about these presumptive connecting factors, but they want the test to be flexible, um, perhaps because they are kind of impressed by how quickly things are changing and how uh, quickly globalization is kind of changing the meaning of boundaries and borders. And they don't want their this Van Breda decision that they spent so much time uh, polishing up to perfection to become uh, irrelevant in a few years when uh, the nature of international business really changes. So they've left the door open to identifying new connecting factors, um, and uh, that should be based on these principles. 
So that's paragraph 92 is, uh, is the one that gets, gets, gets us to that. Okay, so th for this part, the onus is on the plaintiff. Um, the defendant, uh, however, can then rebut this presumption. That's why these are presumptive connecting factors, because the plaintiff, uh, the defendant, can uh, has a chance to say that despite the existence of a presumptive connecting factor, um, for practical reasons, the uh, matter, the, the Ontario court should not assume jurisdiction. And, and there, so when we switch to this, this branch of it, we're looking more at the practical stuff. So, uh, you know, where is that key witness? Maybe, you know, is there solid evidence that, you know, we're, we're talking about a court um, uh, that, that, that in, in Ontario, which really would be unable to, to adjudicate this in an efficient way. Um, uh, so, so there's a chance there for the defendant to rebut that presumption. Then there's and something else that defendants have, an opportunity they have in private international law, uh, which is called the forum non-convenience motion. Um, uh, okay, sorry, I don't have a slide on that, but, but it's all in Van Breda. Uh, where a defendant, if they are being sued in Ontario and an Ontario court has taken jurisdiction, the defendant can bring this motion to oust the jurisdiction of the Ontario court. And to establish, to, to succeed in a forum non-convenience motion, you have to um, identify another forum, another court, be it in a different province or a different country, which has a real and substantial connection to the dispute. And then you have to show that it's superior. So here again, um, it, it, it's all about practical considerations, right? So uh, locations of witness, the cost of transferring it, um, the, uh, the, nation, uh, the, the nature of the law, right? So it's important to re remember that there's choice of law and then there's choice of jurisdiction. So the court, uh, the, 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 the jurisdiction in which your dispute is heard will not necessarily determine the law which is applied to your dispute. Ontario courts sometimes apply foreign law. They can apply the law of Cuba, they can apply the law of the United States. And th there's a process by which they do so where often they kind of have a, a friend of the court type lawyer to instruct them on the law of a foreign jurisdiction. Um, and it's kind of counterintuitive, um, but uh, the idea is that just because American law is supposed to apply to our dispute doesn't necessarily mean that an American court should hear it. Um, okay, so it sounds like some people have, uh, know, know about this already. Um, there is a course, I think, right, still the private international law course, um, which, uh, which, which may be of interest to you. Um, so, uh, so this... So, so the, the choice of court jurisdiction is a separate question from the choice of law, but it can help you on your on your forum nonconvenience motion if you can show that Cuban law would have to apply to this case, because all things being equal, that is an advantage to a, a, a Cuban court. Um, it's not it's not dispositive, but uh, but it is there. So paragraph um, 109 uh, is important as, uh, um, as a rule on these uh, form non-convenience motions. Uh, the burden is on the party. Uh, where is this? Burden on the party. Yeah, the burden is on a party who seeks to depart um, okay, so, so it, and it kind of places the form non-convenience piece within what we said earlier about the assumption of jurisdiction. So, so we start with Rule 17. If you want to sue someone outside of Ontario, you have to pass Rule 17 to get the right to sue someone outside of the jurisdiction. Then we get to the assumption of jurisdiction question, which, uh, which is done under the Van Breda um, Real and Substantial Connection Test. So. The second thing that happens is you have to establish, the plaintiff has to establish this presumptive connecting factor. 
The third thing that happens is the defendant has the chance to rebut that presumption of jurisdiction by showing that for practical reasons, a different court should take jurisdiction. And then the fourth thing that can happen is the defendant can at any time during litigation bring a forum nonconvenience motion. And paragraph 109 tells us what happens then. Right? The normal state of affairs is the jurisdiction should be exercised once it's properly assumed, because we don't even get to forum nonconvenience unless the plaintiff has passed that Van Breda test and convinced the Ontario court to establish jurisdiction uh, from, from the outset. So now once we are to the form nonconvenient, the burden is on a party who seeks to depart from this normal state of affairs to show that in light of the characteristics of the alternative forum, it would be fairer and more efficient to do so, and that the plaintiff should be the benefits of his or her decision to select a forum that is appropriate under the conflict's rules. So that's kind of a, a like a the defendant kind of gets a second kick at the can, right? If, they, if they're trying to get it out of uh, out of our courts. Okay. So um, one thing that's um, worth emphasizing here uh, is that the court is going to take the whole case or none of it. Often, especially with commercial litigation, there will be a bunch of things that went wrong between, say, a supplier and a purchaser, or uh, two companies which were in a joint venture and it's fallen apart and they're litigating. So there'll be, um, you know, multiple disputes between them. And some of those disputes will be more connected to Ontario, and some of them will be less connected to Ontario. So you can imagine, you know, General Motors, an American company um, in a commercial litigation dispute with some parts supplier in Ontario. Some of the things that went wrong between them happened in Ontario are more, more connected to Ontario, some of them are less so. The court is not going to divide that up. They're going to take the whole thing or none of it because all of our concern for efficiency would be um, a ridiculous joke if we were going to now require all of these, these parties to litigate both in Michigan and in Ontario. So it's, it's all or nothing. Okay, so a few questions here. Does the defendant have to wait until the court determines uh, jurisdiction is proper before the form non-con? Okay, so uh, so if a plaintiff um, brings the dispute, uh, br brings the suit, um, and they serve under Rule 17, or they the defendant happens to be passing through Ontario and they get served here, uh, and then there's no challenge to jurisdiction and the court, because uh, we won't get into that, but the, I mean, the, the, the court could in principle uh, refuse on its own initiative to take jurisdiction. If there's no question of jurisdiction raised by the defendant at the outset, then uh, it's probably going to proceed through the Ontario court. Um, and then the defendant can bring that uh, form nonconvenience motion uh, at a later point. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, I mean, they, 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 it, it comes to basically the same inquiry, right? If they bring it early or bring it late, um, they're going to be leading the same type of evidence. Um, so, so the, the defendant can move early or move late, but the fact that they didn't move early doesn't prevent them from moving late because the law is trying to recognize that things can change, uh, as litigation goes on, especially after discovery a forum which originally appeared to be convenient may um, may stop being so. Uh, the court decides not to hear it can, uh, uh, yep, so any um, judicial decision, including a, a um, decision on a motion, can be appealed. And uh, we saw with uh, a couple of cases that um, you can actually have four levels of appeal. If a master makes a decision on a procedural motion, that can be appealed to uh, the judge of the Superior Court of Justice, um, up to the Court of Appeal, up to the Supreme Court of Canada. I think that might have actually happened here. Um, so the mas master, first level, Superior Court of Justice, judge, second level, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court of Canada. I think, I think that happened here, or maybe in uh, Duez, uh, had four, four levels. Okay, any other uh, questions before we get to... Uh, the fourth, oh, sorry, the fourth step. Okay, so, so it's maybe steps aren't the right word, but there's there's four opportunities in a conventional civil action for a court to consider the question of jurisdiction. 
The first opportunity comes um, through R Rule 17. If a plaintiff is trying to serve someone outside of the jurisdiction, then they have to pass the Rule 17 bar by establishing that one of those subsections of Rule 17 applies to their claim. Then uh, if the, if, if the st statement of claim is served, we end up in court and we have the, the initial assumption of jurisdiction. And so the first thing that happens in that initial assumption of jurisdiction, is the plaintiff has to uh, find a presumptive connecting factor. So it's kind of the, the second, second stage, plaintiff identifying presumptive connecting factor. Third stage is the defendant's opportunity to rebut that connection and prevent the court from taking jurisdiction in the first place by showing for practical reasons why it doesn't belong in Ontario. And then the fourth step is the defendant's continuing right to bring a forum nonconvenience motion in which they will identify a foreign court or a court in a different province, which is a more convenient forum and which has jurisdiction over the dispute. Okay. So, uh, so on the facts um, of this case, uh, they take this up at paragraph 114. And at first, it's not looking good uh, for, uh, for Morgan Van Breda, right? So, uh, so her action did not occur in Ontario. Um, most of the damages did not occur in Ontario because she was, I mean, already a paraplegic by the time she had to come back. Um, the all-inclusive resort was advertising in Ontario, but advertising in Ontario does not constitute carrying on business in Ontario. However, nonetheless, Van Breda wins and gets to proceed in Ontario. And the key fact there is this contract, right? So, um, so Van Breda was there as the guest of our uh, squash pro, uh, her squash pro boyfriend, um, uh, Berg, uh, and he had uh, had the right to, to bring her there because of his contract with club resorts through this defendant, one of the other defendants, Mr. Dennis, I guess it's Denis, who operates a specialized travel agency, Norna Sport du Soleil. So this was like a setup where uh, he goes there and he teaches squash to people at the Oncluse Resort. In exchange, he gets room and board and gets to bring his guest. And this is the presumptive connecting factor, right? Because this contract that led to her being there in the first place was um, not with the Cayman Islands Corporation, but with this intermediary, Sporto Soleil, uh, which sets up these deals whereby sports pros go and do this in exchange for uh, for room and board. And that is their presumptive connecting factor, this Ontario contract. Mr. Dini had the authority to represent club resorts uh, and, and created this contract basically as, as an agent for them. And there was no form of non-convenience motion, so, uh, so that lower decision um, uh, is upheld by, by the court here. Okay, how about Sharon, the scuba diving doctor? So, um, so here the damage claimed by the respondents uh, was largely occurred in Ontario, right? Uh, and uh, that it happens because you know the, the family members, uh, their damage is the loss of the income and, and loss of the love and companionship of uh, of Dr. Sharon. Um, but, uh, but that's not enough, right? So that damage, uh, the fact that the damage was sustained large in Ontario um, is not a sufficient presumptive connecting factor. However, the evidence does support the presumptive connecting factor of carrying on business in the jurisdiction. The defendant with Sharon was not just advertising here. They had an active presence in Ontario, even though its head office was not in that province. So you don't have to absolutely have the head office. You just have to have enough kind of commercial activity going on here beyond just advertising. Um, and um, 
the uh, the, the 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 form non convenience motion was uh, was denied in Chiron, and uh, and that's upheld here as well, right? So uh, so Chiron wins as well, and his family also gets to um, gets to uh, pursue uh, the, um, uh, the 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 dispute here. Club Resorts failed to start supporting or showing that the Cuban court would be a clearly um, um, more appropriate form in the circumstances of the case. Uh, when I say it's a high bar to prove, it's get approved by courts often. Uh, um, I would say it happens often. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's very factual. And actually, I, I couldn't tell you in terms of percentages how often this happens. Um, you know, there's a certain tendency once the court has its teeth into something, to, it's hard, harder for them to give it up. Uh, and there may be some, um, perhaps, uh, particularly with a developing country like Cuba, there may be some uh, some some reluctance to trust the system. I mean, I think with other Canadian provinces or American states, uh, it's um, probably easier to do. Um, okay, so. Uh, I want to show you something I come across, which is um, kind of charming. It's sort of the happy ending to uh, Morgan Van Breda's uh, Odyssey, um, because as you know, she was uh, she lost the use of her legs in uh, in this accident, and this is uh, close what she ended up doing. A Victoria woman who is living with a spinal cord injury is going to cycle across India, covering more than three thousand kilometers, pushing a hand cycle. Morgan Pe hopes that her physical determination and her positive attitude will change our perception of people with disabilities. Mary Beth Burton has her story. Morgan Ben Rita pushes her body to its limits daily. She has a mission to cycle India and a message. People with spinal cord injuries can recover, and it doesn't necessarily mean standing up and walking out of a chair. It could be um, being able to move a finger to lift an arm, to move a hand. Those gains can make huge quality of life improvements for people with physical challenges. In 2003, Morgan and her spouse, a world-class squash player, were traveling. On the beach in Cuba, having a vacation, and, and um, I saw a goalpost uh, chin up bar fell on Morgan and, and crack. But even as the vibrant young woman came to terms with the devastating injury, she found hope. When I was there, a gentleman, uh, funded my air ambulance of $40,000 home. Ever since, Morgan has kept her pledge to pay the generosity forward. It started with her paintings like these, which sell for about $1,000. 100% of proceeds fund physical therapy. Morgan's latest fundraiser, a seven-week hand cycle odyssey through India covering 3,300 kilometers. Morgan's riding about 15 kilometers in a day. Right now, she's going to have to step up her training because in India, it's 40 to 120 kilometers every day. Cup on the table. Morgan works out at PATH, the eye on Quadra, an athletic training center for people with spinal cord injuries. Morgan's trainer helps get her into a standing position. The only times in the day where I don't have pain, it eliminates my pain. The clinic helps Morgan build muscle tone and control in her bottom half. I can feel her back coming down all the way into where my hands are, whereas before it was, there wasn't that. Yeah. Morgan says the workouts give her mental, emotional, and physical benefits. It is not funded, and it's extremely expensive. It's about $100 an hour, um, and it is cr crucial to have this kind of therapy. With her cycle through India, Morgan hopes to inspire others who may feel limited by their wheelchairs. I wish I would have had someone tell me that day that no matter what I thought, <laughs> My dream could come true. Find out how you can help fund the dream at morganspath.com. The hand cycle to India begins in January. In Victoria, Mary Beth Burton, A News. All right, we're back. Uh, so I thought that was uh, I thought that was pretty uh, pretty compelling. Um, you know, Rhiannon asked whether uh, these form non convenience motions are often successful, and you know, it's it's worth bearing in mind that uh, that. Judges are, are human, right? And it's when you've got a plaintiff with a compelling story like that and this very seriously injured person, um, it's 
difficult. It's difficult to tell them that they can't sue in Ontario, whatever uh, your application of the law might be, right? So, uh, you know, there's kind of a realist or or critical interpretation of all law, which is that it's just, you know, rationalizations for the things that judges want to do anyway for human factors. Uh, and, you know, we don't have time to, to get into that, which is a, a deeper question. But, you know, definitely if you were uh, the lawyer for Morgan Van Breda, then, you know, you'd want to make sure you emphasized her story and you had her on the stand. And uh, that's going to be as important to maximizing your chances of success as, uh, as it is to, as, as is understanding the constitutional uh, basis of this, right, and all these bigger ideas that they've, they've given us in the case. All right, uh, any questions on, on that before we get on to uh, the Duez case, um, in which uh, a relatively new case, but, uh, but one which tackles the related question of uh, forum selection clause. Uh, okay, so Deborah Duez um, signs up for Facebook, right? Like two thirds of all Canadians, uh, she's on Facebook. Um, but she has a problem, she says, with uh, this sponsored stories, which I think Facebook, do, do they still do this? I think they've ditched this under, um, under pressure um, as part of the new, uh, the new happy, friendly, privacy respecting Facebook. Um, but, uh, but this was something that, uh, they used to do where they would, if you liked something then, and that thing that you liked was a business that was prepared to pay for the privilege, then they would kind of use your like of it to advertise that thing, right? So this, um, Ocean Village, um, company in, in this case. Um, so, uh, this you know, is uh, pretty small, small potatoes compared to some of the stuff that Facebook has uh, subsequently been accused of doing. Uh, but she says that her privacy has been violated because her name and image is being used without her permission to advertise for something else and Facebook is making money from that. And in particular, uh, it seems to violate a chief, which they have in British Columbia. We don't have anything quite the same in Ontario, but they have this Privacy Act, uh, which states that, um, so first of all, Section 3 sub 2, uh, it is a tort actionable without proof of damage for a person to use the name or portrait of another for the purpose of advertising or promoting the sale of or other trading in property or services uh, except consent. So that seems to be right on point. That seems to be exactly what, what Facebook did. Um, unless there's a consent defense for them, which is kind of the, the legal, legally important issue here. Okay, so, uh, so this is a class action, um, which means that you know everything I just said about how De Debbie Duez was upset about this may be false. It might just be that the class action company, uh, plaintiff counsel firm came up with this and they recruited her. Uh, but um, but that's that's the claim, right? Her privacy rights, as well as all these other millions of British Columbians' privacy rights under their Privacy Act, have been infringed. Um, and it's actually still an ongoing uh, class action. Um, if you have any uh, friends in uh, British Columbia who are on Facebook, they, you might want to let them know about this. Someday they may get a four or five dollar payout from a settlement in this case because um, it's still ongoing, right? So this was just went all the way up to the Supreme Court on this uh, procedural question about, uh, about jurisdiction. Okay, so um, the key uh, document in this case is the Facebook Terms of Service. Uh, and here they are. Um, we have not um, read through this in detail. And we have not got down to the part where it says that uh, you agree that the claim uh, must be resolved exclusively in the U.S. District Court for the no Northern District of California or a state court located in San Mateo County. 
we talked about this um, with regard to arbitration clauses, right? You remember arbitration was one of our alternative dispute resolution mechanisms um, where you get uh, basically privatized judging. And many companies will have arbitration clauses in their terms of service or in their boilerplate contract that you sign. Facebook does not, they're not, uh, there's no arbitration clause, but there is this forum selection clause. Um, so they're not trying to keep you out of court, but they're saying the court you need to use is a court in California. So this is a form selection clause. This is right, this is a classic example of, of what this is. Um, a clause which purports to oust the jurisdiction of otherwise competent courts in favor of a foreign jurisdiction. Because there's no doubt that in the absence of this, the British Columbia court would be competent, at least competent to hear uh, Debbie Duez's claim. Okay, so the question is, given that Debbie Duez has agreed to this, do we, uh, d does Facebook have the right to enforce this form selection clause? Because they've brought a motion after the class action was, was filed in the British Columbia court, Facebook brought a motion saying, not so fast, this has to be heard in California. Or do we let her sue in British Columbia as she wants to do. Okay, so what effect, what does the Privacy Act say um, about this? About the question of, I mean, we've already talked about the substantive tort it creates. Did anyone get from the case what, what the Privacy Act says about the question of where the dispute should be heard and adjudicated? Uh, at the Supreme Court? Um, not exactly. Oh, well, Supreme Court, yeah, Supreme Court of British Columbia. Yeah, that's right. Um, section, uh, section four, that's right. Despite anything contained in another act, an action under this act must be heard and determined by the Supreme Court, by which they mean um, this, the Supreme Court of British Columbia. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got um, uh, the lines of the conflict uh, laid out here. Um, so the first thing um, they tell us uh, is about this uh, Pompeii test, right? So this, uh, and, and I should tell you, this was um, um, a hotly contested case in the Supreme Court of Canada. We have, um, it was seven uh, Supreme Court of Canada justices heard this. Three of them sided with Duez, three of them sided with Facebook. Uh, and then it was Justice Abella's concurring opinion in the middle, which, uh, which ultimately swung it. So we're going to look at the majority and the dissent. But anyway, the majority in the dissent all agree uh, that Pompeii is our, uh, is our precedent that we're applying here, which is about when forum selection clauses should be followed. And the Pompeii test uh, asks first whether the defendant has shown that the forum selection clause is, quote, valid, clear, and enforceable, and that it applies to the cause of action before the court. So this is uh, this is a simple contract law uh, question, right? This the same type of question you'd ask about any contract before someone is allowed to enforce it, because a form selection clause, of course, is a contractual term. So so we're uh, in the realm of contract law. Um, we apply the principles of contract law, and you, you know those include unconscionability, undue influence, and fraud. So, you know, there's no doubt that if you ended up signing contract selection, a form selection clause because someone had a gun to your head or someone lied to you about what it, the, the, the counterpart lied to you about what it said, then it would be unenforceable for normal contract law reasons. Uh, okay, so obviously if, they, uh, if that fails, then it's unenforceable. Um, but if it is, does pass step one, then we move to step two. And here again, we're switch onus from the defendant's onus to the plaintiff's onus. And the plaintiff must now show that there is strong cause for not enforcing this forum selection clause. And there we consider all the circumstances, including the convenience of the parties to the parties, fairness between the parties and the interests of justice. So that is um, a, a a kind of a capsule summary of the Pompeii form selection clause test, which um, is agreed to between the, the um, majority and the dissent. 
Okay, so so the first judgment you read was the one in favor of duets, right? Saying throw out the form selection clause, proceed in the British Columbia court, and they draw a distinction between uh, commercial contact cases and consumer uh, cases. So what is this about? This this commercial versus consumer contact. Uh, Yes. Okay. So I think people are people are getting at it. The power imbalance between commercial entities and consumers. Uh, so when you hear consumer, um, you think individual, right? So you know corporations consume things too, obviously. But the word consumer means uh, an, an ordinary person. And a consumer context is one in which you have uh, an individual, and then you have a, lar a much larger corporation, where there's a presumption of uh, a power imbalance, and perhaps more importantly, a presumption of um, a great difference in sophistication, right? Uh, as Jeremy says, to presumptively more sophisticated in terms of their conduct. Um, and yes, Natalie's also right that, that in the consumer context, we have contracts which are not negotiated, right? It's absurd to think that anyone has any power. Uh, it's an interesting experiment, right? You can, um, you know, start a new Facebook account and send an email to uh, their headquarters and say, okay, I'll sign up for Facebook, but and I agree to you know these four paragraphs. But as for this one, I'd rather substitute in some different language. Um, to see what happens, right? You won't get far because uh, they're not in the business of negotiating anything with anyone. That's just can't run a business that way. Okay, so consumer context, we have um, we have power balance, we have different sophistication, we have one party which has designed these terms and the other party which has no ability to negotiate or, or uh, affect them whatsoever. What about the commercial context? Because um, in the commercial context, um, they're seeing, Karak Stanis wants to say that there's different law is going to apply. What do they mean by by a commercial context. I mean, the terms can be a little bit misleading, right? Because, I mean, Facebook and Debbie do as, like, it's a commercial relationship, right? They're um, uh, uh, between corporations. Yeah, between corporations uh, and, and, and more specifically between um, sizable corporations, right? So a corporation, you know, anyone can form a personal corporation. Um, with uh, you know a hundred dollar filing fee and a few forms online, uh, but once a corporation reaches a certain size, if it's negotiating with another corporation of sort of comparable size, then uh, we think about the law in a different way because we're, we we assume we're dealing with parties who can protect their own interests, and uh, and in that context. Uh, the, the value of letting parties make this themselves becomes uh, far more persuasive. If you have, uh, you know, two, two sophisticated companies represented by counsel and they decide that, well, well we want our dispute resolved by, um, you know, the, under the law of Lithuania in a Lithuanian court, um, it's hard to second guess them if they had uh, competent lawyers advising them to make that decision. So um, in this uh, participation question, uh, I was uh, trying to sort of um, establish, because it's kind of an important distinction, which will goes through the law in different ways, um, which are the commercial context versus the consumer context. So this uh, is a consumer context case, right? Even though she's suing the government of Ontario, which is not um, a profit-seeking corporation, it's a consumer context situation, the power imbalance. Um, City of Toronto sues the, the University of Windsor, um, that is commercial context, right? Even though um, neither of those things are profit-seeking corporations. They are both large entities which have the benefit of counsel uh, and therefore we're more likely to respect their agreements. Um, so Burrito Bro uh, is a, a personal corporation suing General Motors. That's consumer context because even though they're both profit-seeking corporations, there's that great difference in in power and sophistication um, and uh, and finally um, here we've got two corporations um, even though one is much much bigger than the other uh, that's still commercial context because the Windsor Family Credit Union is big enough to have um, in those lawyers and have the benefit of the council 
so, um, so, so it's, and you'll see this in legal ethics and other contexts as well, that, that sometimes the law looks different depending on, um, on, on the commercial versus consumer context situation. Okay, so if two, uh, two reasonably sophisticated corporations decide they want to resolve their dispute in California and they sign a contract saying that, uh, and then one of them tries to get out of it, that is very unlikely to fly um, because we presume they know they were, what they're getting into. Okay, uh, the last one was uh, commercial commercial because even though they're different sizes, uh, as long as they both are, are big enough to be sophisticated and to have, uh, and to have uh, acts to legal advice in, before signing that contract, we're going to probably hold them to their bargain. So uh, we've got our, uh, the, so, okay, so the majority judgment here, it's not really a majority judgment, it's uh, the first judgment you read, Kara Kostanis. Um, they say uh, we need to um, uh, apply, and this is what they want to add to the Pompeii, Pompeii test, we need to, um, in step two, consider public policy considerations relating to inequality of bargaining power between the parties and the nature of the rights at stake. Okay, so what are the public policy considerations? Uh, well, they say, first of all, there's grossly uneven bargaining power between the parties. Okay. Um, they say there's great importance, the importance of adjudicating quasi-constitutional rights. So what, what does this mean, quasi-constitutional rights? I mean, keep on getting the Constitution mixed up in this class, which seems to have nothing to do with the Constitution, right? This class is, should just be all about uh, what court are we suing in? But now we've got someone throwing around the C word again, um, which should always make our antennae uh, come up in law school. What do they mean? The importance of adjudicating quasi-constitutional. Let's see, where is that quasi con Yeah. What, what, what is a quasi-constitutional right? Uh, so you sort of have a charter. So what's what's the what's the charter right to privacy? Yeah. Okay. So section eight. Uh, this is sometimes uh, referred to as um, um, privacy, right? Search and seizure is what it talks about. Um, is this is this at stake in Duez versus Facebook? Is that what the Supreme Court means when they refer to a quasi constitutional privacy right? No, it's not. That's right. Andrew's correct. So what do they mean? They don't mean this. They mean something else. The, the best explanation, I think, is uh, down at paragraph 59, uh, where they say that um, privacy legislation has been accorded quasi-constitutional status. Uh, so, so like the Privacy Act here. Um, so it's kind of like a new thing. It was like we, 20 years ago, we had the Constitution, then we had the rest of law. Now we've got the quasi-constitutional stuff, uh, which is to say that these are rights which that you can't use them to invalidate legislation, right? So if the legislature clearly says, um, you know, we don't think people should have uh, a particular privacy right, um, or we don't think solicitor-client uh, solicitor privilege should apply to corporate, uh, corporate clients, um, then uh, there will then that right can be abrogated, can be overcome by the legislature. So that's why it's not the same as a constitutional right, but the legislature can only abrogate it uh, explicitly. So, uh, so a quasi constitutional right can um, can can only be abrogated or overcome by a, a very clear legal directive to the contrary, and you can't um, you can't overcome it. Um, you can't, you can't deprive someone of their quasi-constitutional rights uh, unless you do so uh, very explicitly and firmly. I don't know if people remember when we talked about this in the context of uh, privilege and lawyer-client privilege and the ability of government uh, defendants, uh, the Pritchard case, to uh, so, so, so lawyer-client privilege was also identified as a quasi-constitutional right. 
Okay, so so this um, they say they say is important here, and all privacy rights have this quasi constitutional status, even though I mean we're not talking about a huge infringement of someone's privacy here, right? We're we're talking about uh, we're talking about Facebook, I think, um, uh, and, you know, not someone's home being sto being searched, and uh, and you know. We're talking about someone who liked something and you know everyone knows that your likes are public uh and facebook just went one step beyond and said okay we're going to use your like to uh in an ad for um for this thing that you liked okay but anyway it, it, it goes into the hopper as part of um part of the uh Karak stannis's uh pu public policy considerations um Paragraph 56, unlike um, a standard retail transaction, there are few comparable alternatives to Facebook. Uh, I mean, God forbid anyone try to live without Facebook. Um, uh, I mean, some people seem to survive without it, but, you know, it's important in democracy uh, and, um, you know, all this, uh, all this stuff here. And uh, the um, paragraph 72 uh, even assuming that a, uh, a California court could or would apply the Privacy Act, the interests of justice support having the action adjudicated by British Columbia Supreme Court because this court, as compared to a California one, is better placed to assess the purpose and intent of the legislation and to decide whether public policy or legislative intent, etc., prevents parties from opting out of these rights. So, so, so remember, uh, the choice of court is not the same as the choice of law, but we see here that, um, that she's giving points to the British Columbia side because it's a British Columbia statute and they'd be better, uh, they have some advantages uh, in enforcing it. And finally, the comparative convenience, which should seem sort of familiar from our material on Van Breda, where there are two jurisdictions which could have juris which, which could claim a jurisdiction over a dispute, we do a kind of a comparative thing, right? Which of these is going to be better positioned to efficiently and uh, and act and effectively adjudicate the dispute? So she says that you know if if, if the California courts get it, then um, uh, Debbie and uh, and you know other people giving evidence are going to have to go to California. If the British Columbia court gets it, then Facebook's going to have to send people here. But it's easier for Facebook to send a lawyer to BC than it is for British Columbians to have to go to um, uh, to have to go to to California to to litigate this. Okay, so so Kara Stannis and and her judgment does end up uh, become a uh, law. Um, is wants to add this to the Pompeii test, right? It's now the Pompeii, Pompeii Duez test, um, where if and only if it's a consumer dispute, we're going to throw these public policy considerations in, right? If it's just a commercial dispute, if it's two sophisticated corporations which have chosen um, a, a form selection clause, then, it's the, then Pompeii is still the law, but we put this in uh, for the consumer context. Okay, so three judges um, take that view. They're with uh, Debbie. Um, uh, Justice Abella is uh, kind of cryptic, uh, writes a short judgment, um, or at least the excerpt I gave from you was short. I think there's actually a few more paragraphs. But she says uh, that um, uh, Facebook's form selection clause is not enforced under the first step of the Pompeii test. So she says Facebook doesn't even get through here, right? Uh, Kara Katstenis says uh, Facebook fails on step two. Abella says they fail on step one. And then we come and we'll take a vote, a poll at the end of the class on which, uh, which side you find most convincing. Because we now come to um, uh, the dissent, what ends up being the dissent, the judgment of uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin, uh, Moldaver, and Cote. And they are siding with Facebook, right? They um, don't think that um, that the class should be able to get out of this forum selection clause, given that they all sign this contract. So they talk about the policy behind forms and clauses, right? They say um, 
that Karakatstanis is wrong to talk about how this, you know, deprives, form selection clauses deprive courts of the chance to do justice. They say, far from being unconscionable or contrary to public policy, they're supported by strong policy considerations. They're well established and routinely enforced all around the world. And they're very important uh, to, uh, to increase certainty and predictability, given that we live in a globalized world where people are constantly doing business that goes across borders. And if it weren't for form selection clauses, then anyone doing business that crosses a border would be in a constant state of doubt about how their dispute will be resolved. And any such relationship would be subject to kind of competing jurisdictional claims from all the courts that might be able to, to handle it. We should be letting parties sign form selection clauses to create certainty about um, how the dispute will be resolved. And this redounds to the benefit of Canadian corporations as well, right? We want our corporations to, to go out and uh, do wonderful things in the world and uh, attract business and, uh, and, and you know, bring money back into Canada by succeeding abroad. And, um, and form selection clauses will help manage risks for Canadian companies when they do business abroad. Um, and it's easy, they say, to throw this form selection clause, the one that Facebook had, uh, in the garbage when we think, oh, it's a plucky Canadian versus this big, bad American corporation. But don't forget comity. Right? Comity means we show respect for, for foreign law and for foreign courts, and we expect the same respect in exchange. Um, so if a Canadian wants to start, start a business, and maybe it'll be as big as Facebook, um, we, uh, we, we want this important tool to manage litigation risk to be available to them as well. Um, part of the reason where, where McLaughlin's coming from here um, is uh, that th there's serious evidentiary deficiencies she finds in uh, in the Duez, in the plaintiff's case, right? There's no evidence, they didn't leave any evidence that California courts would struggle to interpret the Privacy Act because uh, American courts, like Canadian courts, routinely do, not routinely, but often enough, apply foreign law when, uh, and that's what they do here, right? There's There's no doubt there's no doubt that the Privacy Act applies to this case, right? Uh, and, and it's just a question of which court is going to be applying that. And the plaintiff has not let evidence that California would be unable to do so. Um, and uh, okay, so, so McLaughlin goes through the same steps here, right? So step one is basically all about contract law. Um, and, uh, and here, uh, you know, the, the term was clearly there. Um, there is no doubt, McLaughlin says, that an enforceable contract may be formed by clicking an appropriately designated online icon. So, right, so it's clear established law that online contracts are a thing. Um, the contract on its face is clear. There's, um, so so uh, Duez runs this argument about how, um, let's see, it's still there. They, they say, uh, they took it out. There used to be a thing in here that they talk about that says we strive, says we strive to respect, yeah, Facebook will strive to respect local laws. Um, but then the terms of service go on to say that, you know, everything, any disputes will be resolved in California. So Debbie says, well, that's, that's confusing. That's ambiguous, right? I mean, how, there's a contradiction there. McLaughlin says, not really, right? Um, this, that, that, that's just bump. Right, and there's no contradiction between striving to respect local laws and at the same time having a form selection clause. So interestingly, they took that out, right? Uh, and I think that's because um, it, uh, it led to confusion and perhaps led to led to litigation uh, to put that in there. So now it just has the form selection part. Paragraph 145: Inequality of bargaining power does not on its own give the court reason to interfere with the freedom of contract, right? As you know from, from contract law, right? There's unconscionability, uh, but um, it's simply not the case that parties with unequal power are not allowed to form contracts, right? If, if that were the law, then um, capitalism would grind to a halt. 
if if uh, if that were enough to make a contract in invalid. Um, would BC have to repeal? Uh, no, so BC wouldn't have to uh, repeal it, um, Andrew. In fact, there's, unfortunately, there's many provisions and statutes which have been rendered um, effectively um, nugatory, have been rendered meaningless by, by litigation, and uh, legislatures don't get around to, uh, to um, cleaning them up. There's things in the criminal code which have been ruled uh, unconstitutional, um, and they're still there. Um, but uh, zombie laws, yeah, that's a great term. I hadn't heard that one. Uh, I mean, should they? Should they? Probably yes, but um, but but no, they don't have to. Um, okay, so uh, McLaughlin, we're still with her, right? We're going now to step two, the strong cause. Well, everyone agrees it's still it's the strong cause test. And McLaughlin rejects the distinction between commercial context and uh, and consumer context and says it's basically the same Pompeii law and the same onus on the plaintiff to show strong cause um, why this uh, why this valid contractual term should not be abided by and uh, and it's interesting like she kind of looks at it from from the defendant's point of view and from corporations point of view right um, the enforceability of form selection clauses, um, uh, where is it? Right, uh, reversing the burden. Um, like if it were not the case that the plaintiff had to show strong cause, the defendant had to prove that a strong cause does not exist, then the defendant would have to anticipate and counter all the arguments the plaintiff might raise in support of there being strong cause, and they would have to do it in every different country. Right, so she's kind of thinking about well, the next Canadian entrepreneur um, creating the next Facebook. Um, how much foreign litigation should they be exposed to? Should they have to, you know, imagine all the suits that might be brought against them in all the countries of the world, and uh, and identify the legal risks in all those different countries, uh, and and, um, and and deal with that, or should we be letting corporations um, have these form selection causes to reduce their risk? Uh, okay, um, so she says no shade can be thrown on California's courts, right? This is um, a, a sophisticated uh, legal system. She can't, does not and cannot take issue with the fact that the state of California is a highly developed and fair legal system, nor with the fact that she'll get a fair trial there. Um, there's some interpretation of the Privacy Act going on here as well, right? So this, as we know, is very important, this Section 4. Despite anything contained in another act, an action under this act must be heard and determined by the Supreme Court. What the legislature could have said, could have written here, was despite any contractual provision or notwithstanding the presence of any form selection clause, an action under this act must be heard and determined by the Supreme Court. So this is kind of a response to Andrew's question as well. They could they can do that, and if they do that, then um, their position, then, then Debbie Duez's position will be a lot stronger um, because that would be a full privative clause uh, saying that under BC law, this, this Facebook term is invalid. They didn't do that. They just said, despite anything contained in another act, not anything uh, contained in a contract. Um, Okay, so, uh, so, so McLaughlin says um, a strong cause has not been demonstrated and this um, um, agreed to contract should be allowed to stand. So let's, let's see what people think, those who are still with us. All right, so a clear majority siding with the plucky Canadian individual against the big bad um, American corporation. Uh, fair enough. And uh, that is, uh, in fact, the law. Uh, they won because um, it's an interesting kind of way that precedents work. When you have a divided court, uh, you have um, uh, three for the on majority, three for the dissent, uh, and um, then um, the Abella concur wrote a concurring judgment. So she agreed with Kara Sanis, but for different reasons. So Abella's reasons don't really matter, but her vote. Um, her vote uh, uh, makes that the law. All right. Uh, 
thanks very much, guys. Um, so on Thursday, we meet in person. I'd like to start at 5 p.m., uh, if we could, and we will finish strong with, uh, what is it, intervention and public interest standing. Uh, thanks very much, and see you then.